Hello and welcome to Bealtaine at Home 2021 and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Tara Byrne and I'm the Artistic Director of Bealtaine, Ireland's national festival which celebrates the arts and creativity as we age. The festival is produced by Age and Opportunity, the national development organisation promoting quality of life for everyone aged 50 and upwards. This afternoon, I'm delighted to introduce a discussion on care, the, sex, the second of our Bealtaine discussion series. This series aims to generate reflection and debate on topics relating to age and ageing. And in devising this conversation, we want to open up a frank and various set of perspectives on the politics of care in Ireland. CARE is chaired by Patrick Frayne, featuring Margaret Oriang, Donald Behan, Sheila Robertson and Mary Louise O'Donnell. Patrick Frayne is a writer of journalism, essays and short stories. He works as a features writer with the Irish Times and has frequently written about the experiences of both caregivers and people in receipt of care for that paper. A collection of his essays, OK, Let's Do Your Stupid Idea, was published by Penguin Sandy Cove in 2020. And it includes an essay about his experiences working as a care worker in his youth. I'd like to thank Patrick and all the panellists in advance, as well as our core funders, the Arts Council and the HSE. Please check out our other events on the Bialchina website and YouTube channels, all available at bialchina.ie. You can also look at agentopportunity.ie for information on our other initiatives. Please also note next week's Bialchina discussion on what it's like to be an older member of the LGBTQIA community in Ireland. Over to you, Patrick. Thanks, Tara. Um, I really liked that funky music on the video at the intro. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone, to this Bialtina discussion of care and caring for older people in Irish society. Um, I write for the Irish Times. Um, as Tara said, I worked as a carer for a while when I was younger. And I believe care and caring kind of need to be at the centre of our culture and how we think of our society um, and we should make it as easy as possible for people to live long, full, loving and creative lives. Um, our, my four panellists today have lots to say on those topics, so let me introduce them. And as I introduce them, you can kind of just wave so that they'll know who's who. So um, I'll start with uh, Donald Bean. Uh, he was a carer for his, he was a carer for his late mother um, who had Alzheimer's and he volunteers for a loan where he meets many older people living at home. So he has a lot of understanding of what people need. Um, Margaret Oriang is a carer and activist for better conditions for private care workers. And she co-founded the Great Care Co-op, which is a non-profit cooperative um, of home carers working for older people within their own localities. Um, Sheila Robertson is 88 years old and a resident of Regina House uh, HSC nurse, Nursing Unit in Clare. Um, she's secretly really from Kerry though, I think. Um, and she can talk about her experience as <laughs> an older person in receipt of care. And uh, last but very much not least, though, though she came along late, the link wasn't working, uh, Mary Louise O'Donnell is an academic <laughs> broadcaster and for a long time a senator and she has long taken an interest in the treatment of older people in society. Um, among other things, she spearheaded a report on dying, death and bereavement, an examination of the state services in Ireland. So we'll have a discussion now. And if anyone watching has questions, you can put them in the comments and we'll come to them at around 10 to 4. Uh, but I'd like to start by asking the panellists about their own experiences of care. And I might start with you, Donald, um, because you retired early from the Air Corps to help care for your mother. And I was hoping you could start by telling us a little bit about your experience of that and what that was like. Well, unfortunately, my mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, she was barely 50 years of age. And the care around that was completely different to what I think people would care for an, an older relative. She was still a very young woman. Um, and as that, she was still a very strong adult. And um, so as a family, we decided that um, we would like to care for her at home as long as possible because we didn't think at her age um, mm -hmm. and she would enjoy going into the nursing home facilities at, at that stage. And um, so as a family, we decided that we would try and care for her at home uh, as long as possible. I don't think we, we ever envisaged the, the, the problems that would arise from that. Um, just the sheer fact that, that she was such a young woman at that age uh, and to have Alzheimer's, we found it very difficult to get services and to get help for someone of that age with Alzheimer's. Um, that was the main problem that arose with us. 
uh, it was then it was as a, as our illness progressed um the other little issues around like you know simple things like getting in a, a stair rail or a stair lift or getting the bathroom adapted we found impossible to get done um, because as the illness progressed, the, the sheer speed of it meant that by the time we'd, we'd seek to apply for it um, and, and try and get funding, that it was no longer useful. Um, so one of the things I, I would think is that uh, in planning for older age is that rather than wait until something is ne- necessary, um, we should be able to look to the future and say, look, at, at some stage, things like this are going to be needed. And so rather than waiting for actually needing them, I think we should be able to apply for stuff like that way before they're actually in use. That's one of the things. And then um, out of that experience, uh, and I saw that particularly like there was people of that age, um, we decided then that we would get involved with, with Alzheimer's Ireland uh, and try and volunteer and give advice to people. And um, one thing that we, we found out was that um, for families like ourselves, advice when you're dealing with somebody so young with Alzheimer's was very difficult to get. Yeah. And so we wanted to not sugarcoat what was waiting for people um, down the road and dealing with something like that. We wanted to explain to them, like, you know, this is exactly what's going to happen. These are the things you're going to get needs to be done and get them done as soon as possible. And um, one thing I find with Irish people is that we we tend to not ask for help. Um, and I don't think there's any embarrassments in ever asking for help. Um, there is facilities out there um, and do do make use of them. and. Um, don't feel embarrassed about asking anybody for help or, or seeking any funding for stuff like that. Um, just because you need a, a stair lift or a bathroom um, adaptation put into your house, don't feel embarrassed about looking for it. It, it makes everything around your life then so much easier. And uh, one of the things with alone is that we would advocate for people to remain at home uh, as long as possible. And one of the ways of doing that is to get the adaptations done around your house. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah always apply for it. The, the funding is there. And the great thing about it, like you, you could get up to 95% of the funding um, or as little as 50%, depending on your, your own personal wealth. Of course, uh, definitely you, you will get some funding there. And as I say, it's up to 95%. So apply for it. Uh, so that's one of the things we're, I've definitely we're gonna, to do. We're going to go on and talk about the different experiences of caring, of caring and the kind of emotional difficulties that come with that. Um, and also the, the importance of choice and people being able to make different choices about their lives as they get older. Um, I'd like to ask you, Sheila, to tell us a little bit about when you first went to live in Regina House. Um, you were living alone and you became ill. Um, and I was wondering if moving, could you tell us a little bit about moving to Regina House and what that was like? Were you nervous about it? What were the challenges with it for you? Uh, no, I wasn't nervous, but, but my GP it suggests that when he called treatment that I was getting for cancer. You know, when I was in the oncology here yeah. for uh, oh, about uh, eight weeks, you know, and gradually he got to the bottom of my give me the drugs that I needed to ease the pain that you know I, I was in pain and I wasn't able to do anything for myself because I wasn't able to get above the pain was so bad. So my GP and the care I was getting here was Unbelievably, you know, I was uh, familiar with the place. I used to visit this house for a long time. Different people that were in here just because of their age and nobody to that. You know, so uh, that was, you know, I, I wasn't nervous. And I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't afraid of it, you know, because I knew a lot of the staff and I knew, uh, you know, I wasn't that far away, you know, I was near home and, yeah. you know, I knew I'd have people coming in to see me and so on and so forth, you know, so I was really happy to come in here. 
so we're, we're going to talk about the different kinds of kind of experiences people have with care. Um, and so you have, you have a good experience, which you have, but I, I know, um, sorry, um, Margaret, um, you've had a lot of experience before you started the care co -op. You had a lot of experience working as a carer for private companies going into people's homes. And I know that you sometimes found that kind of difficult and upsetting because of the pressures you were put under as carers. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that to start. Yeah, from 2008, I was working as a carer with the private companies. And then during the work, they scheduled giving you roster. The problem with the private care is that they underpay you, they underpay carer, they don't value carers, they don't even value mm -hmm. the clients. That's what, from my own experience, because like, for example, you the traveling the distance you, you go between and the time you are given, you can be like from nine o'clock, you're supposed to be with Mary, and then 10 o'clock, you're supposed to be with another person. And you don't, even if you have a car of your own, you wouldn't make the time to be with that person. Within that one hour, or you're in a, on, a tra on a public means, I mean you're going to take maybe 30 minutes in between. By the time you get to the other clients, you don't have enough time. And another thing, which was also, and which was not good, which some companies still do it up to now, 30 minutes with the, with the client. You can't do nothing with the 30 minutes. Even if you are going to put the person in bed, a client in bed, there's no enough time. Because this is an elder person, you should think that give the person time. Do it with, you know, give them time to have their time to go. You can't, 30 minutes that you have to take the person in bed, it's, it's, not, it's not right. It's not good. So my experience and the time you are given, one hour, you are supposed to give. Um, personal care, maybe a wash, or you give a, a shower, make pro, make breakfast. You do make the bed for the clients. You mean you have to make her, you know, comfortable before you go. But one hour goes before even you do anything, or the person you want to go to to is herself or himself. You can't say, "Oh, finish quickly. I want to take you." I want no. It is not right. Just experience. And it, I come from a background. At home, we look after our older people. So those kind of things really affected me. It used to stress me because I could see that I can't give what I want to do to this person. This could be my mother, could be my grandmother, but I couldn't do it because the the the, the company for them is just profit making. They don't think of carers, and the stress you go through. There's no no. No going back, I mean, no support to give you that emotional support mm -hmm. or to ask you that what is happening with you. Are you happy at work? Is everything all right? And for some clients, you find that maybe a client doesn't have relatives or family. And this client have, because I had that experience, I was at these two clients. One was well off and was paying privately. And the other one was paying, HCC was paying her, and she didn't have anybody. She didn't have children. She didn't have any relatives. And her house was not good. There was a lot of wiring. There was, the place was not good. The carpet was <clears throat> completely gone and patches here and there. We, I brought that to the office. I said, this place needs to be done and put properly because where I work is like my house. It's like it's, it's an office. So you make it comfortable for the carers and comfortable for the owner because she had she needs. I was like a voice for her, but they never did anything. They wouldn't do anything, you know. They wouldn't help her. But these other clients, they always check on you if you are with the client which is well off because they know that they are getting more money. They prefer that clients or they favor because they, they have more money. They are getting more money from that client. So they always want to make sure that, oh, have you gone to so-and-so? Are they okay? But they wouldn't mm -hmm. check on these other clients because there was no, nobody was, she didn't have relatives, she didn't have anybody to, to voice her problem. So we used to, we wanted to make it, but it, you know, those, and I think SSC need to have check with the, this private company because for them it's more of, 
just profit, but not for yeah. for that's that's my experience, and it was very stressful over the years because I worked for so many years with the private company before I left. So you've done something positive about that, but we'll come back to the positive steps you took in a minute. But um, Mary Louise, if you could talk a little bit about, I'm just kind of establishing different people with our yes, experiences. Yes. So your own your own yes. experience with, um, yes. I think your mother was being cared for at home for a long time, yes. and then eventually. Yes. Went to and, yes, and much of what has been said it resonates with me. First of all, I never thought I'd, I'd become 65 myself. You never think that you're going to get older. You spend your life thinking you're 38, and you continue to think that. So when I saw my father get his travel um, thing we were, uh, at 65, we thought he was an ancient Viking, and now I have one in my purse. So I'm coming at this with my own pathology as well as with mommy. And, you know, when you talk about planning, you, we don't plan. I haven't really planned. If I was to tell the truth, even though in my late 60s, I haven't planned. Irish people are very bad at planning, even though 800,000 of us are over um, 65. Uh, even in relation to what Adonal was saying, we're bad at planning. And 60% of us haven't made a will including myself. You know, so everything you've said resonated with me. But when it came to Mammy, two things. She was minded at home um, by wonderful qualitative carers. But everything you have said, Margaret, they didn't have the time. They had to run away, you know, to the next person, drive away. We also had, mm -hmm. they're not the same person came every week. Um uh, they might have been a language barrier at the time or a cultural barrier that we needed to get used to, but we didn't have the same carer and all of those kind of problems. And so it was very difficult for mommy at home. And then mommy then needed care. And so mommy went to a residence. So she's been three years with the Little Sisters of the Poor, like um, Sheila, and is very happy in the Little Sisters. So I've had a, I've had ex a experience of living at home with care and now in the residence. And um, so I have, uh, not opinions, but I have things to say on both. But she's very happy in the residence because what people look for is safety, warmth, the very things um, Margaret was talking about, security, surrounding, good food, and all that warmth that comes that uh, Sheila knows about. And that's very important as we get more physically incapacitated but not mentally incapacitated. Um, but and and without the volunteers, you know, so within the within the system of the poor home, I don't know where we'd be because Ma um, Margaret is complete. Healthcare assistants are not paid properly. They are not paid a proper salary. It's like as if we reverse things. We pay people. There's a book I think I might mention. A book and excuse the, the use of the language, uh, Sheila, called Bullshit Jobs. And it's about people who kind of do jobs that really have no significance for other people. Whereas care workers, healthcare assistants, nurses, van workers, all these people, people who stack shelves, supermarket workers, they're imp so important to our lives. We have um, really realised this during COVID, but especially healthcare workers who come and wash and turn and feed and clean and change people when they haven't the capacity to do it themselves and when they need the help. I think they should be paid proper, living, great wages. So I agree with yeah. what has been on both I think you're, yeah. you're preaching to the converted in this group. I think. Oh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but in, um, you mentioned volunteers there. And Donal, a lot of what you do now with Alone is, uh, you mentioned to me as well that the people who are doing the caring don't have the time. So you find that the, pe the older people you'd be visiting, um, they have kind of needs of just conversation and... Uh, could you tell me a little bit about that and the types of things that are falling through the gaps like when you go visit people? Like the, um, one of the things I've noticed with Alone, that occasionally I've visited people and the carer has been there with them. And as Margaret says, literally they're running around. The choice of breakfast is predicated by the fact that they're going to have to get the person dressed. So it has to be a, a cold breakfast. They can't put anything on the, on the, the cooker. 
And so what happens is they're running around and the emotional needs of the older person are never dealt with. And, and by that, I mean, just a simple chat, hello, uh, all of that sort of stuff that, that we as, as individuals and humans crave. It's that interaction with other people. And when the interaction is done at a very rapid rate where somebody just literally all can say is, hello, what do you want for breakfast? Um, what clothes do you want to wear today? What else do we need to get done? And that's that's the interaction that they have. So within the loan, what we do is we like to slow things down. You know, that hour and a half visit, one of the ladies that I visit, what we literally do is we'll sit and we'll watch the chase on TV3 for an hour and a half. We'll have a little conversation. Mm-hmm. I bring along my little dog. I've had to start running because anytime I arrive there, she's always got a bit of cake or a bun or something like that for me there. And it's those little conversations that we can have. And sometimes it's not even a conversation. As I say to you, just sitting there watching the chase and I listen to some of the comments that she will make about some of the contestants and the answers they give. And it's that simple little interaction, that human interaction that as individuals we all crave, I see is so very important to people. Like I remember the whole issue about um, one of the Healy Rays was talking about pubs down in Kerry. And uh, one of the things I think about, like th- this whole idea, like the, the elderly gentleman going to the pub and, and he has his couple of pints and he has that chat and it's that couple of hours every evening, you know, the, the, the mental well-being, the health that he gets from having that chat mm-hmm. to me far outweighs whatever the medical issues that some people will say that he has two or three pints in the evening. No, for me, it's that, that he gets that interaction with other people. And that in alone, that's one of the things that, that is so, so brilliant is that we do, we get to meet people. And it's one of the things I was shocked about that in a city, say, the size of Dublin, where I live, that individuals can be so alone. Um, and, and even like you know, I, we were talking here about the pandemic and stuff like that, like, I've noticed like that, 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 that some people, the only interactions they might have, and particularly older people, are with the cashier in the supermarket because that's the only time they might get out. And uh, it's things like that that I, I, you know, it really makes the job that we do in alone so important getting into homes, having a chat with people, even the telephone calls. <laughs> I'll tell you a great story. We do telephone calls in the lawn where if we can't get in actually to the house and visit them, we we'll give them give them a call and we'll give an old chat and we'll stay on the phone for an hour or so like this. And one of the volunteers had said to me, he says, what do you do now is make sure you get the old Sunday supplements that you get in some of the newspapers where it has what all the soaps have done for the previous week because I don't watch soaps. And that was one of the best things that somebody said to me because you'll have a chat with somebody for 40 minutes about what happened in Coronation Street in EastEnders and you'll hear it in their voice that that's all I want to have a chat about is you know what happened in EastEnders what happened in Coronation Street and that's one of the things like that I think alone we do and alone we do very very well it's that that interaction we have with people. Can I ask you Sheila um, you're quite happy there in Regina House and I was wondering could you tell us about what good care looks like with like the people who work there why do how do they make you feel comfortable and at home there how do they make me anything i want anything something you pick up off the floor they're willing to help that's what they're there for they tell you ring the bell if you need something and and you know i don't ring the bell that often, you know, because somebody will come to the door and see if I'm okay or I'm in the sitting room and they're passing by and, you know, they put their heads in and they'd say, you all right in there, you know, are you okay, do you want anything? You know, they're always willing to help the staff that are here. They're so caring and so gentle with everybody. No matter what, no matter how many times they're asked for something, or, you know, so the people have dementia and that, you know, and you ask the same question and you try to answer it as best you can, even though, you know, you don't know sometimes what they're talking about. But the care here is just wonderful from the top down. No. That, that thing that Donald was saying about people being lonely, you have friends there, don't you? Like you have made friends in Regina House. Yes, I have friends there. And uh, I had a friend that used to come in respite every, uh, for two weeks, uh, 13 days, she used to say she'd get, you know, here. And she's loved. 
and we got to be great friends. And even as soon latest today, I had a car and a little note inside of it from two people. I, I sang up one of the ladies that's here. He dropped in a world search book, a person book, and a little note inside of it, you know. So, you know, we do make friends, like you see, and we talk, talk to one another right now and have conversations. And it is a happy place to be, like, you know. It's always like that. Always like that. And we had, we have lovely staff. That's very important, like, you know. And no matter what you're asking to do, they're there. You know, well, Noreen is here beside me. And then, as to God, the things I have to do, and, you know, she comes in and I know people from her area. And then, which, you know, she, she tell me about this when somebody has passed away. And, you know, you would know them, she said to me, and I'd say, yes, yes, I do, you know. So, I was involved in a lot of things outside before I came in here. Like, you know, yeah. until I got sick, I was involved for a number of years. Activities, you know, different things. Going here and going there. And the day afternoon, we used to have day. And you know, and it was, it was good. It's good. So I'm quite happy. I wouldn't ask to um, be moved any other you know. Well, so we might, I was going to ask Margaret to tell us a little bit about the Great Care Co-op, because that's an, uh, that's an endeavour that's trying to make life better mm -hmm. for people who are living at home um, and ageing at home and the carers working with them. So could you tell us about the origins of it and what it was? Yeah, <clears throat> Great Care Co came about because of the problem we had. We came together, nine of us, migrant, right, migrant women and the Migrant Rights Centre. They supported us to start this project. So we came together. And before that, there was domestic workers and carers, some of them undocumented, who have been working in Ireland. And they've been mistreated, they've been mistaken, I mean, taken advantage of little pay, and they didn't have a voice because some of them didn't have, they don't have paper, they're not documented, they don't have what, they don't have, uh, they don't have their citizenship or they don't have a uh, leave to remain in Ireland. So that was a problem. That is how it came about. So we said, why can't we do something about it? So we came together and with the migrant rights center, we sat down and we started just thinking about how to build it up 20, from 2017. So until last year when it took off, we just started working, getting clients now one year since the company started. So it, be, it is because of what the problem the carers have with the private care company. <clears throat> Great Care Corp is different because we don't want carers to walk to be traveling from like from here, from the island bridge to Dundrum or from Dundrum to to Dunlory like that. It's, it's, it's taking a lot of stress and time traveling. So we want our our model is different because we our carers work within in the area. They live in that area. So our our first model we we started in Doki. That's where we started from. So the carer who lives are in, in Doki or they live in in Dunlory, just nearby. They are the one who works there. And we have 12, 12 teams in each places, in each places. So the 12 team they manage themselves and they, they don't have an office to rep they can report to them. We have a back office. But the carers they manage themselves, they do their own rotaring, they do everything, they do their own meeting, they see what is wrong, what they can do, what they what is they, they manage themselves, and the care corp is owned and managed by carers. 
is owned by the carers. They're the one who own it and they manage it themselves. It's not like a private mm -hmm. company somebody is giving. And on top of that, we pay also mm -hmm. pension because most of these companies, they don't pay you pension. And we pay good wages. That's the most important thing. And also we value our clients so much. We take great pride that we have to look after our clients properly. We have to give them that dignity. We have to do what is best. What the other companies are not doing, we have to look, we have to find out what best is for a client. We ask them, we know, we talk with them. What do you want us to do? What 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 is your need? Mm -hmm. Because they can go for the activities that in their house, they can do all what they want to do in their own house. With our support, with the with the support of the the, uh, the support of the of the carers, so that is the difference. And we got and this um... model from the model we borrow from Netherlands, and it's the first yeah. of its kind in Ireland. But we we hope. We plan to move to other areas as time goes because this we are just starting to walk or to crawl. So we hope, and we got some funding, very good funding for three years. We are one of the twelve awardees who got the, the, yeah. the what? Yeah, equality fund from Rethink Island. And I think you, you said to 12, me that. Yeah. You mentioned to me when we spoke before that any profit that's made goes back into training. Yeah, any, yeah, any profit that is yeah. made, we we revert it back to, we revert it back, and for development of the of the carers for their education, training, and all the thing that we want to make them better. We don't. It is non. It's non profit company. It's not for profit. It's for the yeah. people to make the life better for the carers. Good wages with pension and comfortable, not traveling long distance, but you work within the area. And also I think, to mind about our clients. I think Mary Louise wanted to come in on something very good. Well, you put I, your I, thought, <laughs> I put my hand up like, like a good schoolgirl. I think that's a fantastic um, organization and idea, Margaret. That's brilliant. It's as good as because co-ops were used to be a wonderful um, organization, still are, but they've kind of faded out a lot in every country town. You know, there was a co-op, a community co-op or a shop co-op and the people were involved and then people then, you know, that routine didn't take over, that the people had freedom then to use the co-op for, for the best advantage of those it was serving, which is what you're doing and getting some Something from it yourselves as opposed to the routine that I felt with all the private companies, you know. And even if I have to say with the HSC, it was just routine in, out and not enough time. I think it's a super idea and it's as good nearly as fair deal in the home, you know, as opposed to yeah. in residential care. It's another kind of fair deal where the people in the home have more control over it and as well as the carers have more communication and control with the people in the home. I think it's a terrific idea and well done and may it develop and have the arms right through um, South County Dublin and beyond. Well done. I think it's a great idea because that's one of the things that I felt that it was all routine and form and many and not enough training and communication and time and you know an, an awful lot of pe people want to stay in their home as long as it's physically possible you know as long as it's possible and really many they weren't able to do it because for many reasons you, you were just left to breath and one of the things that you you said also was that you also need somebody to talk for you or to speak for you I think Donald um, or, or Sheila might have mentioned this that sometimes people as they age don't have the same power of their voice you know they have the same ideas and imagination and mindset but you need somebody like that woman you were talking about uh, Margaret you need somebody to speak for you and the studies will show if you have a daughter, you have better chance, you know, that you have a woman to speak for you. Because sometimes the fellas don't have the language for it because this is a sexist remark now. But no, but it's true. The studies show that you need a spokesperson, somebody to speak for you. Because I've met many people now who wouldn't have brothers and sisters or they would have passed, they would be dead, or they didn't have children, or their children are in other countries and don't have that energy to go and talk to somebody like you, uh, Margaret. So you 
make some very good points, and it's well done. Well done. Um, that issue of how people having options and wanting to stay in their home. Uh, you, when we spoke before, Donald, you mentioned that, like, and, and they they are bringing out grants and things to allow people to, you know, get stair rails and downstairs bathrooms set up and things. But is it like in an ideal world, people should have different options, right? I'm address, addressing this to Donald, but I'm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's it's one of the things we don't we don't plan for uh, is yeah. our future care. Um, and even though I think we're, I remember some people talking about the fact that a lot of people now living by themselves in three bedroom homes and stuff like this. And I think Mary Louise, in one of her little chats, never mentioned that there's no option there for people to downsize properly. And when they downsize, that they you know they'll downsize into a smaller flat, which has to be a, a, a floor or basement flat or a, a first floor flat, so there's no stairs involved. But also probably within that then as well, like the, if you're you're looking at flats in Dublin, they're probably the same price as a three bedroom semi anyway. Um, in regards to that, like one of the things we should plan for is I know in America it's a big thing now assisted living, uh, and I know like uh, Sheila over in Clare, there is a, a sort of a, a, an assisted living residential area in Clare, which I know of a couple of individuals were in it, and, and in that regard, there's a place down in Nace as well, uh, there at mm-hmm. the chapel where you you live in a small little unit where you'll have your own bedroom, your own little kitchen, and you can have visitors over. And this is the kind of thing that we should be looking at in, in the future. Um, it's all well and good in saying that we're going to put in stair lifts and we're going to put in bathrooms and stuff like this. A lot of people, by the time we, we get around to that, it's already too late. Um, and then as well as that, um, I, I felt a lot of problems could come from other family members when it comes to that because people are worried about, God, when they do pass, we're going to be selling this house on. Who wants the house? with a ramp at the front door, a ramp at the back door, a disabled bathroom, even the, the whole idea of calling it a disabled bathroom is some of these things, the language around it, people find very ugly. And it, it's not a, like it, stuff like that, a stair lift. Um, oh God, nobody wants it to, to buy the house afterwards like this. And so it's stuff like that we need to be planning for and getting away, away from it. Like we're already planning for our pension, so let's start planning for our future living. I've started doing it. So it's, it's one of the things I've, I've learned from when alone. That same already like in, in housing now, like the, the the regulations are there, like the light switches should be at a certain height, doors should be of a certain width. There should be some capacity there that in most houses, the capacity to put in a, a larger bathroom should be there rather than, you know, you look at the size of someone's suites or now look at some of the size of the bathrooms. There's no way they would have the capacity to be to be adapted for future living. And so we definitely need to be looking at regulations and looking at planning within ourselves. And incidentally, we're talking there about um, people having a voice for somebody else. One of the things I would be that that for future planning is that we should be nominating somebody that will speak on our behalf, um, be it a family member or, or be it a good friend and stuff like that. Because we do tend to, to lose that that sort of voice. Um, and then it's very, as I said again, people tend to be embarrassed in Ireland when it comes to help. Yeah. You know, um, we will speak for somebody else, advocate for somebody else. We tend not to advocate for ourselves and so, yeah, get somebody, a good friend, and believe me, they'll, they'll fight on your behalf because that's, as Irish people, we do that. We'll fight for somebody else, but not ourselves. So, yeah, definitely nominate someone to speak on your behalf. This ties into um, something like, uh, Mary Louise was saying before about uh, an age-friendly community. Like, there's something, there's something a little wrong with the way we think about ageing and care in Ireland. In fact, I think what's wrong is we don't think about it. We think it's like, Someone else is dealing with that. Um, this is more of a philosophical question for you, Mary Louise, but what do you think is the blockage? Why aren't we, as a community, more conscious of the fact that this is something we're all going to face for ourselves and for other family members? You know? I, I, an interesting question, because if somebody said, are we a sexist society, I would say, no, we're not. You know, I've met feminists. My mother was a feminist. She's 98. She's still a feminist. So I haven't been around that culture where that separation, that feminist thing. I, I always, 
it's sort of myself as independent and get out and do things. But if somebody said to me, are we an ageist society? I might be more inclined to say, yes, we are. Primarily because even I was walking the roads there during COVID, you'd be ignored by young people. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a kind of, um, not easy to, to miss, you know, and I'd be coming down the road and people, young people would be coming speaking and they would nearly walk into you or ignore you, you know, and then I sort of realised as Emilio Fela wrote a book, Am I Somebody? You know, as you get older, you become less noticed or are we not on television and radio, you know, in our 70s and 80s? What is it that, you know, that we have the wisdom and yet we're, we're, there's many of us, we have the wisdom, but we're not asked the questions, you know, that we're, we're not, I mean, George Hook might have contradicted that because he became a kind of a hero in his 70s, you know, you know but I, there's, there's a thing about, I suppose, you know, there is something about growing old that we don't ever think it's going to happen to us, Patrick, you know, and when we don't yeah. think it's going to happen to us or that we're going to die, you know, let's push that even further, you know, that you don't really think you're ever going to get old. And so that you always think of yourself as young or that people, and young people consider you, that's somebody out there or over there. Or the fact that aiding that a lot of, like if you were to ask the Japanese, the Japanese, you know, the elders, the elders live with them. There's no just differentiation. We have taken on a kind of a culture, and it's been written about by many people, like Athol Gwande, like many people have written about this. And we have considered that residential care, outside what Sheila is saying, which is completely different, but if you look at the alone report, 36,000 people in residential care, 12,000 of them that didn't need to be there. So we have not, we have sort of put sometimes our elders somewhere else, you know, up a long avenue in a residential setting or in the house that nobody goes to except maybe the carer. You know, we have really not attended this. Now, maybe within rural Ireland, it's different within a village because a village would rear a child and it'll also mind somebody who is an elder. I have some um, older aunts in Mayo and they are extremely well looked after by the village. And what Sheila was saying about all the things she was involved about in her community community, they come in and they visit her and they're still there and there's people she knew and neighbours. When you're in Dublin and it's getting bigger and wider and more anonymous, it's not the same sometimes, you know, when you leave an estate. I don't know whether I don't agree with this, but there's not the mm. same. The communities within the city centre are being dissipated. There are transient communities. Their apartments are being rented. And unless we actually do create a village within a building, which is what Margarita Solon did. You were talking about it, Donald, down in Macaulay Place and, and maybe in mm. County Clare and other right. places. Yeah. Create that, the natural separation of the elder from um, the 40, 50 year old will happen, the 30 year old. And you could see the need for people to have the elders around them. COVID has taught us that. So the government, it's very important that we hold on to that connection because people, as they get older, sometimes they get even more anarchic. I found myself getting more anarchic and more provocative. As I get older, because I really couldn't care what people think or even how I look. You know, that I have things to tell or say, and I've worked hard for it. And I see it with my mother. And, you know, people can be completely incapacitated, but their minds are alive and their opinions are alive and their wisdom is there. And that's what I think the separation is. And we don't ask them enough, what do you think? And we don't listen to what they have to say. Can I so, can I ask Sheila, Sheila <laughs> for a moment? I was just going to ask: Do you feel that you're part of your community still, and that people, and also, do you feel listened to there in in Regina House? You'll be, oh, oh yes, oh yes, yes. Yeah. I'm still part of the community, I'll tell you. Yeah. Pardon me, and and uh, Regina, and. Um, I think I'm part of that too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been you coming in, I'm coming in and out here for a long, long time. You know, uh, yeah. digital people and you know people that I knew that were in here. I was visiting them, you know, down along the line. But 
never did I think that I would be here myself, you know. But, you know, the Lord sent me something that I didn't, wasn't able to cope with, and, uh, you know, this is what I ended up, you know. Um, but I, I'm not very happy here. I didn't, you know, I didn't hesitate when I was yeah. told if I didn't say, well, no, I don't want to go. This is my home. I didn't say that. I thought, well, thanks be to God, you know, I'll be looked after. It, that feels like the system working well. Like, and I know the system doesn't work well everywhere, but it, it feels like it worked well for you. It's well run. It's well run here. It's, it's, it's not a big place, you know. It's we see everybody like you know coming and going, and uh, um, well, since the COVID, we were scattered out here and there, like you know, every room was occupied, yeah. every room, you know, the sitting room. So I can see everybody passing up and down the road, and I can see the children across the road in the school out at play and, uh, you know, playing ball. They have hurries. There's a football pitch up at the back of us and they're all okay. doing co-work. They had no school. They were, uh, they were all going up and down. They didn't have a football hanging out of their bag. They had hurries and strippers and the girl what, you know, so so in, I was just saying, so you're kind of in the middle of the action there still. You can still see the community. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. I, I, the visitors are starting to come in now, you know. Good. We, didn't, we didn't have them all along, so uh, they're starting to come in now, and it is making a difference. You know, people are kind of perked me up again, you know, and they can have, they were coming to the window, you know, and uh, yeah. you had your mobile phone inside and they had their mobile phone outside the window. And, uh, you know, they could do that at home. The only thing you could see them from the gas. Yeah. That's it. But that's what it was, you know, we were, the wind, the cover was, I kept here, like, you know, it was kept out and the staff worked yeah. very hard, very hard to keep it out. And, uh, you know, the woman that time, they had families of their own, they came in in the morning and, you know, uh, we didn't know there was a cobra. You know, <laughs> the atmosphere to was here, it wasn't similar. Morning or growing or anything like that. You know, they were all, it was amazing. I think Donald has hand up there a minute ago. Like a good yeah, school boy. Like like a, <laughs> a very good school. Like, I know this all talk about caring and stuff like this, that, that sometimes nursing homes are seen as almost the last option. That, yeah. that people are, are, are sent off to, to stay there. And as much as I would advocate for people to um, stay at home for as long as possible, I, I think we should have a sort of a, a nursing home environment and a sort of that caring for the elder environment that it's almost as if people would want to go to a, 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 an individual or a assisted area like that um, where they can still continue on their life as, as normal. It's just that they have the extra help, that's therapy, it's, uh, medical or anything like that. And that's definitely something that, would, that we need there's a fear within our society um, that we will end up there uh, and stuff like that. It's something that it's just another transition in our life. You know, we, we, we leave our homes, we build our own home, we move into our own home and we transition then to uh, another facility like that. Um, and even using the word facility tends to, to, to have connotations as well. I don't know the proper word, assisted living and stuff like this. Nursing home, again, raises certain connotations. But those sort of places, we should look that they're not some place that we we'll end up. It's some place that we will look forward to going towards. And um, that's something we should definitely be planning for in Ireland: is that we look forward to that sort of life. 
Can I ask um, Mark? Sorry, did I? Um, no, but I just I was Mar going to... Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Mark Louise. No, no, sorry. No, no, go ahead. My, my, my apologies. I'm... I, I was going to take some questions in a minute because I can see them there in a the little side panel waiting to be answered. But I, I was going to ask um, Margaret about her experiences as a carer. Uh, Donald mentioned this when he was talking to me as well. Like older people that you would work with, you it's a very rewarding experience when you have the time. Like, because could you tell us a little bit about your experience as a carer in, in well, that regard? Care is, is it's very important and it is really good because you build that relationship with the person, with the with the elder person. And that is very, very important for the elder person and also for you. Because you become like although you have your boundary, there should be boundary between you and the and the client. You should know that there's the boundary and confidentiality and privacy of the client. It's very important that you must know. But and also give respect to the client. But there's not building the relationship between you and the care because there's trust there's trust there's love there's you know compassion that you give to the to the to the to the elder person is very important so as a care i think that one i built so many friends through that my working years with as a care giver at home on care because the way you build your the way you you handle the, the the client is matter also. Because you work with them, you should you should work with them in a in a way that you should give them respect, help them to do what they want to do. You don't have to push them. You ask. You must ask what the client want and do according to what the care plan goes with. You don't step over, do thing which you are not supposed to do. You must stick to the and the policy of the company. You should also mind about the pulse of the company and also so to work as a carer and to be with the client is very important to build that relationship over the years or even for a short time and another thing which i would like to say that <clears throat> and most of this care company what we were trying to 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 to, re, to to reduce or not to do is changing changing carers in some homes because with the company I work with, sometimes they send you here, tomorrow they send somebody else. It's not good for the for the client at all, not good for the elder person. Different people coming, different people coming every day or every other day. That is not good because it's good to keep one person and they build, because that is how you can also build a good relationship with the, with the person. He knows that this is the person coming. Unless somebody is going on a holiday or somebody is sick, that's when somebody should step in to help. But not to be changing, changing yes. carers every now and then for the client. That is something which is not good. I'll, I'll take a few questions. Um, uh, Jackie <coughs> has asked. Um, she meant she, she notes that I said we're preaching to the converted earlier, and she talks about how leadership and political will and innovation are key factors to change the status quo. But knowing how to change is the challenge, which is a question mark. So I guess she's asking us, how do we change the culture around care in Ireland? Um, would anyone like to take that? You can put your hands up again. Like I like being the teacher. <laughs> Mark Lewis. Well, you have to be, it's very different. I used to think of politics that you could you go in on Tuesday and change everything by Friday. You'd have, oh, I, I had this ambition. Time. You have to keep something on the agenda. I hate that word, but you have to keep it front and forceful. You know, with with, with Bieltana, you know, Bieltana and festival and with on the news and on radio and with presenters. And you have to keep it. It's like if the people do it. The government have to change. This has happened about housing, although it was coming over the hill for 30 years, what was going on about housing now and renting and, and unaffordable housing for everybody, um, which affects the elders as well because they can't downsize, because if they go to downsize, they have to rent. Um, you have to keep stuff front and forward on the agenda. That's how you have to do it. You also have to do what the government said they would do and create the care commission, not to write big reports and put them up on shelves where they languish away for years. And we have this round mulberry bush roundabout. We're going to do, we're going to say, we're going to be. And we were still saying it 10 years later, where there's actual pilot 
action where things are piloted like Margaret's idea is piloted in another county and Margaret is sent to another county to pilot it. You know, that we, we, we use people like Margarita Solon and Nace send her, like the Little Sisters of the Poor. What are they doing differently? What is alone doing? Send them. You know, that the pilot programs, physical pilot programs are up and running and we're not waiting for the Paddy the next best thing to come along because he's there and he has the ideas. All of the people here today have the ideas and they're not being implemented. You see, a lot of politics is about evasion. Evasion is the name of the game and I want to play the game with you. And you stay away from actual activity. And everybody from Alone and Sage and Age and Opportunity, they know what they're talking about. And people like Mar Margaret, use them and let them go and pilot the same programs and things, physically, physical action. And unless you keep that front, evasion takes over. So the, 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 the questioner is right. That's the only way to do it. And energy, energy, which... Um, you know, older people may sometimes have it in their head, but they mightn't have the physical energy. Although, if they get very mad, they'll become on the street. And you're yeah. not old now, uh, 40 or 70 or 65. You only might be only starting, you know. So did anyone else you know. want to? Did anyone else want to comment uh, on that? I was just going to say it like that. that uh, I think it's through things like this um, that we'll be able to advocate for older people because. Everybody is going to be old at some stage. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as that voice rises up, um, we were talking earlier, like Mary Lou's mentioned about older people, when medical card issue, I remember them stood outside Dal Aaron. Um, <laughs> and I think that when they stood outside Dal Aaron, people started to notice. And again, yeah. as we as, as our population ages, and that, that group becomes much larger, much more vocal. It's just a pity that, unfortunately, it, it probably the voice will only be raised when problems arise rather than trying to, we're, we're going to have to be, unfortunately, um, reactive as opposed to proactive when it comes to these, some of these problems. But I'd like politicians for once just to see what's waiting down the road and act now as opposed to kicking the can down the road for the next governments. They, they tend to look at once, once they're elected, how am I going to get elected in five years' time? Some decisions are based on that timeline as opposed to further down the road. So... And so we get politicians that will, you know, become proactive as opposed to reactive. But I think with voices think are Margaret, raised, that, that hopefully will happen. I think Margaret has a comment as well. Yeah, I want to comment to say that the government or the alone and other organization and the elder people need to advocate and lobby the government to change how they handle the elder people. Because these are some people who are teachers, they were taxpayers, they were doctors, they were what, but everybody's going that side. So it, it, there should be change from now onwards, that they change it for the future. Because if they don't do it now, when will they do it? Because everybody is going to go. Everybody, everybody, we're getting older and older. So everybody will be affected. So there must be change in our Elder people are treated careful. There must be a change for them. And um, it should be a... nothing like alone and other organizations, maybe even Red Care Corp and the elder people, as Louis said, that they should go on the street. That one can be done. Because if they don't do it and lobby also the TDs and the what, because they're the ones to get the votes, but they don't do anything. Um, there's a question from <laughs> Joe Tierney. There's lots of comments here saying that the Great Care Co-op sounds like an amazing initiative, by the way, it just is. comments yeah. saying it sounds brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, Joe Tierney says it sounds brilliant, and he was wondering yeah. about, this is something I wrote about at the weekend a little bit in the paper. Um, obviously, we need to have well-paid professional mm -hmm. carers, but he talked about also how caring for care's sake can be normalised, um, which I think is a, another thing I'm kind of interested in, because I think our culture kind of sometimes thinks that caring is somebody else's job, someone else's dirty work to do. Um, and I, I mean, I think what he's getting at and what I think is that it should also be part of how we think of our existence in a community. Um, so how does caring for caring's sake become normalised? Anyone want to take that question? Well, to, wow. educa to education of the young. You know, yeah. and you see a moment of that in COVID when the grandchildren ran to the grandparents. Um, 
education is the way that young people don't believe that they're siloed. You know, I don't think they do. I think we have a new generation who actually don't think that because grandparents are playing a very distinctive role. And if you look at the Netherlands, they have placed creches within um, residential areas. They have done loads of things to try. And, and when Sheila was talking, she was talking about the school next door, you know, the children's voices and going past the the gate and coming in and looking in and becoming friends. It, it, that's sort of, I think, because I think Irish society is a deeply caring society. I always remember in 1986, um, uh, we feed the world. We were, even though we were an island, we, 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 mm. we gave the, the, the most amount of money. And recently in relation to um, the Late Late Show, we had uh, many collections and we were so generous in relation to be a house and so I, I I think we have it in us and it is there it's just that sometimes the root we're, we're not given that opportunity we're not encouraged you know I often feel that I live here uh, living here in Klonski that you know there should be more calls for people who who are semi-retired or half retired you know to come in to different communities and uh, there's not, not, not enough kind of information to us so you can do this you can do that you can do the other to communicate we think we're a great communication society but we're actually not we're more siloed all in bits and pieces and phrases, you know, and so, but it's education really is the way to bring out the best in ourselves in care. If you look at our poetry and literature, if you look at, if you look at the green agendas about care of the planet, if you, we are a caring society, if we're allowed, if we're allowed, and if those who want to do it are nurtured and paid well to do it. There's a, another comment here from Ash, I think your name is, and she says, I've been a family carer for the past seven years. The government don't care about carers. We need more carers allowance. We need respite, counselling and help with our own mental health, with our, with our own health. And um, actually, when I was talking to Donald before, you, you were talking about when you b became a family carer, you were su surprised at the lack of emotional support. And when right. I was... A professional carer for a while I couldn't get over the fact that I was going home in the evening but there was like mothers and spouses out there caring for people around the clock um, absolutely like um in my my prior job in the air call um what we used to do is we, we'd have little debriefing sessions if, if because we used to work in the the air ambulance down in that lawn um and it was just that simple chat of how are you doing today um what was that like it's we don't tend to have that as carers. Um, the only other individuals we can talk to are in our own family who are already doing that caring. Um, and I, like we talk about respite there as well, like respite. Yeah. When we get the respite, you're, you're winding down and then you're winding back up again to get back into the caring environment. And even within that, there's not proper respite care there. But like, there should be education with people as to, and then that's not sugarcoated. When, when you are a carer of a particular loved one at home, there is difficulties, but those difficulties being over, can be overcome. And once we're aware of those difficulties, they're not as difficult as we thought they were going to be. One of the things about caring is there's a tends to be a fear. And there's a fear that once I start caring for a loved one, oh my God, how long am I going to be caring for that individual? What actually is entails? Um, what help am I going to get? Who's going to help me? Um, what can I do? All of these questions that we, we never really get any answers to. But the simplest thing that we could do is, is just that having somebody calling in and seeing how we are. I'd like to see an expansion of the health um, nurse system within our local community. Um, mm. That little road system that they go around and, and visit um, local carers uh, and we're caring for family members. Because the strain, the emotional strain, the physical strain, the tiredness that, that, that carers suffer. And unfortunately, what, what happens then is that when you're caring for a loved one in a situation like that, um, you're, you're caring for an individual th that you love. And then, unfortunately, sometimes that will, you know, that love that you have turns to resentment to, for some individuals because of the, the length of time that they're caring for them. And that's a horrible situa situation to end up in. Um, yes, definitely. You know, I'd love to see more help given to carers at home and for carers within the care industry. Um, just that simple little, at the end of the day, how does that go for you? Um, 
if you have a difficult situation, like it, with an, an ambulance service in the fire brigade, if you have a difficult job, a difficult call on that particular day, you're pulled off the line. You're taken out of that until your your proper debrief, and then you're allowed back in once once you've recovered emotionally from that. There is no emotional recovery if you're a carer at home. There is no emotional recovery yeah. if you're a carer like Margaret. You simply are going on to the next individual, and you're bringing that that trauma from the previous care that you've had onto the next person and it tends to cascade into itself um, and so something needs to be done yeah in that regard I, I know from talking to family carers in, in my job as a journalist as well that it's, it's also very isolated because there's a sense oh. that society has left you to deal with this um, mm. and you're worn out because you're so busy so you don't always have to I'm always impressed by family carers who are able to advocate because um, it's so hard if you're doing such a mm. difficult job. Um, yeah, the, the, the part of how we got into this is we had to write a little piece. And um, one of the things I'd like to say is that I remember going for walks with my mother and I would see people looking at me and it was a pity that they would look at me. And I often wonder, what, did they feel sorry for me? because I was caring for my mother more than they felt sorry for my mother because she was the individual that was being cared for. And that was, the, I used to find that, that, that people, you know, <laughs> they were more worried about ending up in my situation as being the carer than the person who was being cared for. And there's something, something wrong with that. If that's what you're worried about. Or you people, did, uh, go or ahead, people who have an adult, an adult, um, with, um, profound needs, you know, and who are walking. I would have family member like that and who are walking or need respite or and you see people reacting, oh, God bless him, you know, or am not I the lucky person that I have in that problem, you know, as we walk mm. on. You know, there, there is, and people who have to care for very difficult situations in their own home daily, you know, a son or a daughter or a father or a mother. You, you, you raise great... Great issues there, Donald. It's 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 a very complex situation, isn't it? It's mm. very complex. And the last thing you need is to be phoning for help. Yeah, and not getting it, I mean, whatever but asking for yeah. it, not getting it, or getting it too late, or begging for it, or exhausted, you know, mm. trying to find it. Yeah. There's a question from Dimpna Gilligan and she's asking, could the citizens assembly be a place for all these suggestions to be discussed? Like, is that something you've thought about um, as, a, as a former senator, Marie-Louise, what do you reckon? Well, I don't know. Our politicians are supposed to be, you know, doing what we want the Citizens' Assembly to do, except they're a little slower at it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 the more and more organisation, yes, the Citizens' Assembly is a huge part to play, but I just think that's more talk and more evasion. We know what we need to do. We just mm. need to do it. We're so bad at it or we're very fearful of it. Yes, they can use it, but it's it, it's difficult to, to move things on. You know, it's just to move them on with the politicians we have elected. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another, yeah, I, I there's definitely, I would, really. I would, yeah, yeah. I would say that because, like, we elect politicians to make the decisions for us and to act on our behalf. And unfortunately, I don't think, I don't think they do once they once they get in there. No. There's a lot of comments and, we, and questions, and we can't get to them all. Um, but uh, Jackie Brown commented. Uh, she said, "What she said, well said, Margaret." She's talking but she's had experiences of having to have her pyjamas put on at 4.30 in the afternoon to suit the needs of a service, not her needs, um, which is exactly what you were talking about. Um, the idea that people's care is completely down to a roster. Um, and uh, there's, and again, a lot of people uh, quite impressed by the great care co-op, so good work. Um, yeah. I, I think we covered an awful lot there and I'm really thankful to all four panellists, uh, Margaret, Sheila, Mary Louise and Donald. I uh, thought that was a really interesting and constructive discussion and thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of things we could go on and talk for another hour or two uh, if all of the comments and questions were responded to. We, we'd all get Zoom fatigue. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you very much to everyone for joining in. Thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say one thing before we go? Just to to remind people, anybody who's listening to this, that there is help for you out there. Don't feel embarrassed about asking for the help. It is there. Don't feel shy about it. 
do ask for the help, please. And That's a good with, remark, yeah. Patrick, I'm just saying, I could never thank the Little Sisters of the Poor on the Roebuck Road uh, enough. And I believe totally in residential care when it is necessary. I couldn't thank them enough, their care and their grace, everything Sheila spoke about in relation to her own residential care she's in. Could not thank them enough. I couldn't do enough for them and they can't do enough for their residents. Um, but residential care is completely necessary when it is necessary. Necessary. Does uh, anyone else have anything to finish up on? I, I, was, I feel like I'm leaving it up too soon. Sheila? No. Yeah, oh, uh, it is necessary when it's necessary. I mean, mm -hmm. I needed it and I had another option, like, you know, and I couldn't get the carers weren't there, they weren't in my area, and you know, I was told there was no, there was no carers. There wasn't enough of them to keep going, you know. Yeah. And I, one person came in to me one day, and she said to me, when she was going, I'll be back next week. Now, what was I going to do from one week to the next? She said she wouldn't be able to come back again until the following uh, uh, because of a Tuesday, she she came in yeah. and she said, "I could not, I couldn't come back until next week." So, so what was I to do? Yeah. You know, I was depending on um, my sons to come in in the evening, you know. So it's back to uh, the importance of providing options for people and providing properly resourced care in the community in different forms. Uh, I, I would love to talk for another hour on this because you all have such interesting insights, but uh, we've gone way over the time. <laughs> so thanks a million to everybody. Thank you very much and thanks to everyone watching.